In today's video, I'll be talking about gene regulatory network evolution, and we abbreviate those as GRN. I want to talk mostly about the terminology here today. So we're going to start out with what is called a kernel. So a kernel is going to be this evolutionarily inflexible unit of genes that interact with each other. Here's our kernel, and a kernel is going to specify a particular body part. And we say that it's evolutionarily inflexible. So evolutionarily inflexible. And what that means is that basically if you have a kernel that say specifies eyes, that it's going to specify eyes, maybe fancy eyes, maybe just you know simple photoreceptor plus pigment eyes, so something really, really simple, something light sensitive. It's going to specify eyes in lots of different kinds of organisms. So eyes, we find them in animals. So an eye kernel will specify eyes in basically any kind of animal. So in fruit flies, it'll specify fruit fly eyes. So I'm going to just draw a little fruit fly eye here. In humans, it'll specify human type eyes, so people eye here. And in octopus, the same kernel is going to specify octopus type eyes. This is what an octopus eye looks like to me. So same kernel, but it's going to have very different outputs depending on the species that it's in. And I should mention that these are really mostly hypothetical. We don't have um, we don't have a lot of really good evidence for these kernels, meaning these um, evolutionarily conserved gene regulatory network interactions that persist across um, a deep evolutionary time. All right, so that's a kernel. The next one I want to talk about, the next term I want to talk about is a battery. So here we have a battery. And just like a kernel, a battery is also going to be a set of gene regulatory interactions. So interactions between genes um, in terms of transcription, translation, and uh, turning signals on and off. <clears throat> so batteries are going to be involved in things like cell and tissue differentiation and specification. And these are more evolutionarily flexible sorta. So they'll usually involve um, some of the same interactions uh, across species, uh, but there'll be you know some interactions that are also um, conserved. So we say they're a little bit more evolutionarily flexible. And that's because they're going to have to do things like cell type specification and tissue type specification, which differ greatly between organisms, even in the same kind of a tissue. So I want to think about um, kind of how a kernel and a battery could interact with each other. Uh, so let me get back our starting kernel here. So our eye kernel. So this is again going to specify eyes in a variety of different species. And let's see kind of what this will do with the battery. So we might have a, quite a few different batteries that this triggers. So one could be, I'm going to just draw them as little blue boxes. So one might be the battery that specifies neurons. Right? We need to have neurons um, hooked up to our photoreceptors in order to get a light signal out. Okay, So one might specify the different kinds of photoreceptors. And one of them might specify different kinds of pigment cells. Now neurons, photoreceptors, and pigment cells, we think these are pretty much conserved across animals or across a lot of animals at least. Um, but the ways that these get specified, the shapes that they are made in, those can differ. And so that's what I mean by evolutionarily flexible. So um, for example, um, or well actually I'll just put this part first. So we s expect to see some, some differences between homologous cell types. So that's the evolutionary flexibility here. 
And um, just to kind of get this a little bit further down, we might be thinking of something like um, corneal cells. So we have corneas in lots of different kinds of eyes, uh, but they're, they're specified fairly differently. They can use different kinds of proteins to build that hard, clear tissue. Um, so for example, we might take two corneas that look a lot alike, like the cornea in an octopus and the cornea in a human, and they're going to be made out of slightly different things, even though they look really, really similar. Um, but they're both triggered by this eye kernel. So I want to kind of think of this like corneal kernel. Um, we might have genes A, B, and C uh, that specify cornea in an octopus. But we might have a slightly different set of genes, let's say A, B, and D, that specify cornea in a human. Okay, so within each of these boxes here, within each of these boxes, we might have slightly different sets of genes and different sets of interactions, um, but there should be some similarities in there, some genes that we see kind of across species, some things shared. So there's one more unit that I want to talk about in here, um, uh, one more term, and those are plugins. So I'm going to put those over here. Plugins. And plugins are these super inflexible subcircuits. Uh, so they tend to be kind of smaller. They're not quite like as grand as a kernel or battery in terms of the fancy types of things that they um, are going to specify, but they're more like workhorses. So they're going to be triggered to do really specific kinds of tasks in the cell. So these are subcircuits of genetic interactions that are evolutionarily inflexible um, and they're used in many different contexts. So there are these real workhorses. So I'm going to give an example um, for cornea. Um, let's say that we have a plugin that, that specifies keratinization. Okay, so this is our plugin here. This is going to be a set of genetic interactions that lead to keratinization. Of course, a big part of this is just going to be making a lot of the protein keratin. So that is evolutionarily inflexible. There is this output. Um, for this homologous protein. That means you just have to make this homologous protein large numbers of it in these particular cells. So that's what I mean by it's inflexible. There's not another way to do keratinization. Now this can be used though in lots of different contexts, right? So we can um, use it to make keratinized skin cells in humans. So I'm just drawing our little skin cells here. This is what they look like to me. So we can make keratinized skin cells we can um, use it to make uh, keratinized hair. That's what my hair looks like. Um, and we can also trigger in um, this uh, kernel for eye specification. So I'm gonna give us our eye kernel here. So in places where this eye kernel is active, then we're gonna get something like a cornea. So this is light going through the cornea. Okay, so this plugin for keratinization can be used in lots of different contexts, even though it always has the kind of same output. So all of these different kinds of components, the kernels, the batteries, and the plugins, they're all linked together with on-off switches. And these on-off switches can be really complex. They can be really simple and they're gonna mostly be involving transcription factors, turning specific transcription factors on and off. And that can be due to many different factors. So it could be due to upstream signal transduction cascades. It could be due to release of repression. It could be due to buildup of enough of weak transcription factors to trigger an event to happen. But those are these on-off switches that are gonna be linking the kernels, the batteries, and the plugins.